Considering a camper build, but wondering how it's going to work for your dog, today's episode is for you. I haven't featured the dogs much on this channel yet, so today is going to be a little bit of a different style of video that I hope that those of you that travel with pets will enjoy. Let me introduce you to the pups. So the big black dog here sitting on my left is Glia. Glia I've had since 2011, and she has been on so many trips with me. We've been backpacking, tent camping. We lived in an RV for three months together. We've traveled to all of the US national parks that I can drive to, and Glia is still traveling with me now. She was up to Alaska with me this last summer, and she'll be headed to Utah with me this coming month. Sasha, the little one here, is kind of my part-time dog. She's technically my parents, but we spend a lot of time traveling together also. She's also been on those road trips to the U.S. National Parks. Um, and while she hasn't spent as much time in this truck camper with me, she is a trooper as far as camping in any of the conditions that I've had her in so far. And then, of course, I'm Kate. If you're new here, it's nice to meet you. If you've been watching my Truck Camper Build series, it's nice to see you again. In today's video, I wanted to talk all about my experience traveling with dogs with a real focus on how that works in the truck camper. This is a small space, a little harder to get into and move around in. And so there are and so there are a few extra considerations for the dogs when I travel in a small space, especially when I'm on the road for a month or longer at a time. In order to make this a little bit more of a Q&A, I went and I asked ChatGBT what the most frequently asked questions about traveling with a dog in a truck camper were. And so today I'm gonna answer what ChatGBT thinks are the 11 most frequently asked questions about truck camper travel with dogs. Question number one is how do you secure your dog in the camper during travel? And my quick and simple answer to that is Glia never rides in the truck camper itself while we're traveling. If you've seen the design of this pop-up truck camper, you know that everything folds down. There's not a lot of space. It is not made to be ridden in during travel. So Glia rides up in the cab of my truck with me. I love the Toyota Tacoma it has a fold down back seat. So it actually turns into like a full bench. And so I fold down the 60%, the larger side of that. And I put a bed back there for her and she's got a nice and secure spot to travel. Now, that being said, I never did train her to travel with a seatbelt attached harness or in a crate. And if you're just getting started with your dog, I highly recommend that you do. It is dangerous to get into a crash with a dog that is not secured in the cab. There are only a handful of companies that actually do like crash safety testing with their products. And so if you're just getting started with your dog, I'd recommend checking out Sleepy Pods harnesses. And then there's a couple of brands of crates also. So my tip number one in this video is to head over to the website of the Center for Pet Safety. They have a fantastic list of the companies that have actually done crash safety testing so that you know that your dog will be as safe as possible if you get into a crash. And again, they've got crates, they've got harness attachments, a lot of good information there, but there are limited companies that have actually done the testing. Question number two, what challenges have you faced camping with a dog in a truck camper? There are definitely some challenges that are specific to being on the road in a truck camper with a dog versus other styles of travel. So the biggest thing that I had to consider when building and designing the truck camper was how Glia was going to get around in it. You know, she is 12 years old now. She's getting a little more arthritic. And so that jump up into the truck bed is a little bit hard for her. So we designed a step, right, that I can put into the tailgate. And honestly, I like it too. But it has enough room for her to jump up onto that and then jump into the truck camper itself. Itself. So that helps her get into the truck camper. And then she's pretty good at getting up into the bed when the bed is folded back like it is now. When it's pulled out all the way, I do have to lift her into the bed. So that is a consideration that if you're traveling with a bigger dog, you may need to make steps or something else to help your dog get up and around because it's kind of narrow maneuvering when the bed is pulled out. But otherwise, Glia gets around real nice in here. Um, there's not a whole lot of space to exercise or play, so we have to take our hikes and, and get exercise outside. And then I did design the bench seating area with Glia in mind so that there is plenty of space. I don't know if you can see it super well right now, but she's laying in a bed next to me on the bench seat. And the bench seat is long enough that she can lay there, and then I can sit on the edge, and another person can sit on the little bridge piece that goes across. So that works out pretty nice. 
Another challenge of the truck camper is that it's a smaller space. So Glee is not as comfortable being left inside of it as she is in like the motorhome or travel trailer. Um, and so honestly, when I run errands and things like that, I normally leave her up in the cab of the truck, not in the back of it. Um, so that's just, every dog's a little different, but I've heard of a couple people that said that they had a dog used to staying in a van or a travel trailer. And when you downsize to a smaller space like the truck camper, it can be a little bit more claustrophobic feeling for the dogs. But my tip number two is to work on setting up a fantastic space for your dog inside the truck camper that's nice and cozy. So favorite dog bed, favorite toys, try to make it as much like home as possible. And most dogs will acclimate pretty well to being inside a new space. Question number three is how do you manage your dog's exercise and bathroom breaks while on the road? Honestly, for me, this is a pretty easy thing to do. But what I tend to do is every time I stop to pee, I spend an extra 10 to 20 minutes walking the dog. So I factor in a little bit of extra time on road trips. When I'm traveling just by myself, it's quick, easy in and out, IP, I get gas, go. But when I'm traveling with the dogs, an extra 30 minutes at every stop is factored in at the beginning of the day so that I have plenty of time to walk them, let them sniff, let them stretch their legs. Both of these dogs grew up traveling, so they're wonderful in the car. I really don't have trouble with them asking together or needing more frequent potty breaks or anything like that. But you know, we stop every two to three hours to fuel up or to go to the bathroom ourselves. And that tends to be perfect for the dogs. And so again, a little extra time letting them sniff around, enjoy the sun, stretch their legs, and then we get back in the car and finish driving. And so that's my tip number three, is just to plan an extra 20 minutes at every stop. It's simple and it's easy and it'll keep your dog fulfilled on long travel days. If you need more than that to keep your dog busy in the car, pack some chews and treats that take a little bit longer. So you can freeze a topple with some food or if your dog does uh, bully sticks or other chews, you can bring some of those along too and it'll keep them nice and busy in the car. Question number four is what tips do you have for finding dog friendly campsites? Honestly, I haven't found this one to be too much trouble at all. So I don't stay at the big RV parks. I tend to do free camping like BLM land and things like that, which are almost all dog friendly, but do double check the rules. Um, some of the wildlife management areas, things like that, you cannot have your dog with. So just heads up. Um, and then most campsites are dog friendly. So the big thing is you have to have your dog on a leash. They can't be a nuisance and you have to pick up after them. So, but if you do those things, almost all of the national park campgrounds, state park campgrounds, they will allow dogs inside of them. And so I stick to, I really do stick to the state parks, national parks, state forests, national forests. Um, I don't do a lot of private campgrounds. And that means that most of my campgrounds are fairly uniform in the recommendations. I also don't have issues with keeping my dogs on leash the whole time. Glia is a little bit reactive and she's going deaf now. So she's rarely off leash at all, unless she's in a fenced in backyard area. Um, and Sasha, also has a high prey drive, we'll chase after bunnies and things like that. So we're used to camping with the dogs on leash. And when we camp in a travel trailer, I bring along some fencing that we can set up so that they have a nice area outside to enjoy the campsite. Another little tip though, is that most national parks do not allow, do not allow dogs on the trails themselves. And so just know that even though they can be in the campgrounds at most places, there's a few exceptions, like the Black Canyon of the Gunnison in the spring has mule deer that will try to go after your dog, so dogs can't be there. But Mostly the dogs can be in the campgrounds, just not on the trails. I tend to find that state parks are a little bit more dog friendly on the trails. And then national forests, BLM lands tend to be very dog friendly. So my tip number four, if you want a really dog friendly experience, look at national forest campgrounds, BLM sites. Those tend to be wonderful areas to have a dog along with you while you camp. Question number five is how does your dog react to different environments and climates? So both of these dogs have traveled so much that the different environments don't bother them too much as far as new commotion and, and things to see. They will get excited with new smells and scents. Like they met an armadillo for the first time in Florida and it was the most exciting thing. It took them a little while to calm down. Um, but overall, they adjust to new situations pretty well. Climate wise, both of them were raised in Minnesota. And so they're fairly used to cold temperatures and wearing coats and boots when needed. Glia had a little bit of a hard time with all the cold rainy weather when we were up in Alaska. Um, but I've got good gear for her and that helps quite a bit. Really what we're not as used to is the hot weather. So I'm curious to see how the trip down to Utah goes, but if it's gonna be too hot out, we'll just end up carrying tons of water and hiking early or late in the day and avoiding the midday hikes. So my tip number four is just avoid extreme weather conditions and make sure that you have just as good of gear for your dog as you do for yourself. You know that saying that there's no bad weather, only bad clothing, <laughs> that holds true for your dog as well. Now. 
again, not all dogs need a lot of clothing. I mean, if you have a Husky, you are not gonna need a coat in winter weather. But when you have a short coated dog like mine, um, sometimes you do need to bring a few extra pieces of gear to keep your dog comfortable in the different temperatures. Um, Glia often wears a sweater at night when we're sitting around at a campsite and that just helps her stay nice and comfortable, um, just as comfortable as I am when I'm throwing on a light jacket. Question number six, how do you plan your itinerary to accommodate your dog's needs? I honestly don't have to do a lot of change to accommodate Glia. Most of my road trips are designed with her in mind. I mean, it's why I'm not flying to destinations. I wanna bring her with, and so driving is the best way to do that. And so then I do a lot of hiking, um, which she can come along with. And I go into road trips with her knowing that I'm not gonna eat in as many restaurants. I'm not gonna do as much shopping. I'm not gonna do as many city things. And so we keep things more outdoors oriented so that she can join in on all of it. But honestly, I love hiking and I love camping. And so it's not much of an accommodation on my part. My tip number six is to plan the trip around your dog. If you really want to do something that isn't dog friendly, make sure you check out Rover or another pet sitting app or local boarding facility so that your dog has a plan in place. I've definitely taken advantage of those. So up in Alaska, I wanted to hike the Harding Icefield Trail, which was amazing. And so I booked Glia a stay for that day at a local boarding facility. There also are some national parks that have kennels and things like that that you can leave your dog at. So just plan ahead. If you know something isn't dog friendly, get your dog good accommodations for the day, but otherwise stick to the dog friendly entertainment. Question number seven is what items do you pack for your dog's comfort and well-being? We already talked about this a little bit, but the big things that I pack for her are dog beds. Um, I have even purchased a second camp chair for her to have because she doesn't like to lay on the ground as much. She does have an outdoor bed that we use that um, she lays on well, but she prefers to be a little bit off the ground. So she has a chair. Um, I bring with a topple that I can fill with wet dog food so she has something to lick on and chew on and interact with when we're just sitting around. And then I bring her coats and her gear to keep her warm. And there's just not much else she needs. So food, meds, you know, got her dog bowl for water and for <laughs> for food. I always make sure I have her vaccine records and a first aid kit and things like that in, in case of any medical emergency. But overall, she just needs some warm clothing and a dog bed and some food and she's a happy girl. I do also bring a harness and a leash for security while we're out hiking and sitting around the campground. And then she does wear identification as well. So she's got her collar with my phone number on it and she is microchipped just so in case something were happen she has a higher likelihood of getting back to me so tip number seven is you don't need a lot to keep your dog comfortable but make sure you have a few of the core items so that they can stay snugly cozy well fed and in good health while you're on the road question number eight is how do you handle encounters with wildlife while camping Luckily, we haven't had too many encounters with wildlife while traveling we mostly see them from a distance and that's the way I like it so I do keep Glia on leash while we're hiking, and that limits her chance of running after wildlife like a moose or a black bear or things like that. And then when I'm in grizzly bear country, I do carry some bear spray just in case of a bad encounter. We give a wide berth when we see things like elk herds and things like that. Try not to get too close to them. And most of what we see is little rodents, you know, squirrels and rabbits and things like that, which are exciting. We've had an encounter with a fox before, but luckily I was hiking with someone else during that time period and they were able to step ahead and ask the fox to move off the trail a little bit before Glia directly encountered it. The worst wildlife experience I have with her was backpacking. Um, at about like 3 a.m. in the morning, Glia popped up, looked around, and before I knew it, she had jumped over my body and through the screen of the tent, chasing something. I sat up. It was a Glia sized hole in my tent and my dog was nowhere to be seen at three in the morning. She did come back like 15 minutes later with porcupine quills in her nose. So I think we all know what she was chasing. Um, and that was no fun. So we were in the middle of the back country. And so I had to pull those porcupine quills out by hand, which you shouldn't really do. Um, they have little barbs on them and they can break off and cause infection if they break off under the skin. But we didn't have a lot of choice being out in the middle of nowhere. I like to think that Glia learned her lesson from that, but I doubt that she did. <laughs> so my moral of the story is potentially have your dog leashed when you're sleeping at night and or don't just leave the screen part of the tent up. Make sure there's a physical obstruction. I don't even know if Glia knew that the screen was there. She just looked up, saw it and chased. <laughs> but 
Porcupine's the worst of it. We haven't had any encounters with bears or moose or anything more scary. But tip number eight, though, is that you do have your dog leashed or under really good voice control. The biggest reason dogs get into trouble with wildlife is that they are not under control and they are chasing and aggravating wildlife. Question number nine is what advice do you have for someone considering traveling with a dog on a truck camper for the first time? My advice would be to start with small trips. Even getting your dog used to being in the truck camper in the driveway like we are right now is a wonderful way for them to get used to it. Don't leave them alone at first. Make sure you're with them so you can see if anything's stressing them or bothering them. And if you do everything in small, slow departures, make sure your dog is nice and relaxed the first few times out. It should be an easy transition for them. So tip number nine is to go slow. Make sure your dog is comfortable before you spend a month on the road. <laughs> Question number 10 is how do you balance your dog's needs with your own desire to explore? I think we talked about this a little bit earlier. I don't bring the dogs with on trips where I don't want to do dog friendly activities. So I focus on dog friendly things when the dogs are with. If I want to do things that are not dog friendly, I find a kennel, boarding, pet sitter, whatever I need so that they're taken care of. And if I want to spend a whole trip doing non dog friendly activities, excursions like horseback riding or maybe going to museums or wine tastings or things like that, then I just plan those trips without the dogs. So if you want to bring your dog along, plan a trip that they'll be excited about too. And then if you want to plan a trip where there are things you want to do without them, that's great. Just make sure your dog is well taken care of and maybe leave them behind for that one. And question 11, have you faced an unexpected situation related to traveling with your dog? Yeah, there's been a few of those. On my first three month road trip in 2018, when we were traveling in a motor home and going to a bunch of the US national parks, my motor home broke down in Arizona in 100 degree weather and we had to go shopping for a new RV in a rental car with two dogs. No fun. And even worse, when I was up in Alaska this last year, we spent so many days sitting outside and Glia kept munching on sticks and grass. She normally can eat those things just fine, but the day we were set to visit Denali State Park, she started throwing up in the morning and I ended up having to bring her in an emergency clinic. There we found that she actually had an obstruction at the outflow of her stomach and needed emergency surgery. So there I was in Alaska, far away from my friends who are veterinarians. And I was at a strange emergency clinic with a dog that was living out of a truck camper. And she had to have abdominal surgery to have the foreign body removed. So it was grass and things watered up in there. And then to top it off, I had to recover a dog with an abdominal incision in a truck camper. We did get an Airbnb for a couple of days. So she had a couch to lay on the first few days afterwards. But there was a lot of lifting her up and in and out of this truck camper so that she didn't jump or stretch or hurt herself. And I really had to adjust my trip after that because she couldn't do hikes. So for a couple of weeks, we had to take a much more relaxed approach than I had been planning on. There's so many beautiful hikes in Alaska and it was a shame to miss out on them, but she's more important. So having a dog along can come with some unexpected emergencies and issues and struggles, but honestly, to me, they're so worth it. These dogs are a big part of my life and I love traveling and adventuring and I love finding ways to include them in that. I hope that this video was helpful for someone considering truck camping with their dog. If you have any questions about how it's gone for me and Glia, leave a comment below. And I will be getting back to more truck camper focused topics soon. But I hope you guys enjoyed meeting the pups and have a great week.